when Yvette mentioned the opportunity to speak about my grandmother Lucy, I thought it was uh, the perfect time to do it. So you're a direct descendant of Lucy. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, just seeing a lot of the work. When we first started this project like two and a half years ago, uh, we found out that there was a documentary film made about her uh, oh. by PBS back in like 1973. So we went wow. down outside of Portland and interviewed the filmmaker and mm -hmm. he gave us an original copy of that film. Wow, I have to see that film. Yeah. yeah that was out there. So uh, there's the Eastern Washington University has that and then they gave mm -hmm. us, I don't know, probably 40 big pictures, like 11 by 14s of all the yeah. different things that she had done throughout her her uh, career. I don't even, I don't, it seems weird to call it a career because it was a much more than a career, I think. Yeah. Um, it was really a, gosh, I don't even know, legacy, building a little legacy. It's a legacy, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's what I tell folks, because they think this is a career for me, and I say, this is not a career. Yeah. It's just the, it's, when you're raised this way, it's all you know. And you don't really walk any other path. It's hard. You try to get off of it sometimes, and you always end up being pulled back on the path that is your purpose. Um, can you tell me? Do you remember? Do um, you remember your first recollection of your grandma? A lot of it is through uh, my family, my dad and my uncles, and uh, a lot of the people that I met along my own trail, my pathway to my own. Uh, design, and I remember meeting a lot of leaders like Wilma Mankiller and uh, prominent individuals who we know of today who would reach out to me and say, I knew your grandmother and this is a, the piece of advice that she had given me and I would like to pass it along to you because it belongs to you. And uh, it was all good, great advice from these very prominent leaders that I met throughout Indian country and even outside of Indian country, I'd meet people in congressional halls and they would say, oh, I knew your grandmother. And, she was that type of leader where if she entered the room, everyone kind of stood tall and they would always give her that right of way and be like, well, Lucy Covington is here. And we just kind of did whatever she demanded because she didn't go there to ask for anything she gave there to give guidance. And I really took that as, you know, a real powerful peace of mind for me because to go somewhere and to offer uh, leadership is uh, such a uh, powerful way to be. She wasn't ever asking for anything and she didn't really have to be bullyish. She just had a way about her which was respectful but still strong and prominent and very commanding. And I think it was because she came from such a long line of people, many powerful chiefs you know, before her time, her ancestors who were also great leaders, great orators, and had uh, you know, carried great visions during their time as well. And so she, as another avatar in that line, was able to just carry on that way of life. So she was walking this path, this legacy. And so when I'd hear from people a lot about her and how she managed, you know, whether it was uh, decisions or her travel or finances and how she was fighting against uh, termination, defending sovereignty, I would think uh, ultimately, her her pathway was leading up to uh, protecting and defending not only the rights of tribal people, but the rights of children uh, and the environment. Um, but really, she was promoting a legacy of education for our youth because she was seeing how our people were being attacked, and she was seeing how this would impact not only you know her children and grandchildren, but those who are yet to come. And so, while I was not able to be with her. Physically, in spirit, she has always been with me. So in spirit, I feel everything that she has done. And every time I meet someone who reminds me of her, I can feel that. I can feel that you know she's guiding me through them. And to this day, I still feel that. I come across a lot of people who will uh, approach me and say, I knew your grandmother. In fact, I met one of her attorneys that she worked with, and he was uh, a photographer. And he approached me while I was in Seattle, and he asked if he could just photograph me. And he said, you know, you remind me of this woman. And I said, that is actually my grandmother, Lucy Covington. And he says, you're kidding. I used to be her pilot. She used to charter uh, this plane and I would fly her back and forth and we would go to Olympia or we'd fly to DC and 
uh, and he had all these um, written works of all their meetings that they had, and so these um, proceedings that took place. Uh, he, would, he would talk about just how prominent she was standing before Congress or standing before all these um, authoritative decision makers and how she was, and he would say she was very elegant with her her braids and her moccasins and, and her regalia and speaking her language, and then she would translate back to English, and she was always upholding uh, the, just the the aspect of being tribal, being indigenous, which is ultimately the way our people should be. Because if we, as she would say, if we don't practice it, we lose it. So she was walking her talk uh, every step of the way. And as many people know, they know about her, her practice, her legacy as she traveled. You know, we know about those stories where she would sell family cattle, a head of cattle, and translate that into a trip to lobby or to have these meetings with individuals to ensure the protections of our people and our, our inherent rights. Um, but all that took work. And she was so dedicated and so committed. Uh, I would just hear of that commitment uh, through these stories. And so for me, as a part of that legacy, as a granddaughter, a descendant, uh, it's always been more so inspiring because I can take pieces of that and uh, ultimately the entirety of, it, of everything that she's done and use that in my, my path and my purpose. Um, but she does speak through me, and she does, like my grandparents, they all speak through me. Uh, and I think that's, that's really what's most beautiful, because they were, they were setting all of us up in a good way like that. And that's ultimately what I want to do, is set our children up in a similar light. Uh, but that's, that's what I understand about her, from all of the people that I've met, and their experiences are shared experiences. All of these stories correlate and they all come to a similar conclusion that she was a woman of the people. She led this path of leadership, uh, not for herself, but to ultimately pave the way for the future generations. And it was for education, and it was for sovereignty, it was for the independence of our people, to establish a place within this world, uh, to ensure that we can continue to be a voice, whether that's a voice for nature or a voice for humanity. That's a, I, I think, a really a traditional way of looking at things, a uh, perspective that I think has kind of been shaped over the years for you. I'm just going to have a little bit better on you. It's kind of neat to hear from your perspective of how because I, you know, when I talk with Mel and I talk to these other people, um, to be able to, to 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 think of it from the perspective of the bloodline is different than than somebody that she mentored, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that she uh, chose or somebody that uh, was brought to her or somebody that um, at, when it, when it's in the blood though it's something very different. Mm -hmm. Um, it took me a long time to understand and really realize what they would tell me when I was growing up. You know, uh, they would say, "You come from, you you come from a strong bloodline. You know, your ancestors are strong people." And it never occurred to me, you know, when you look at you know the 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 you know the genocide, millions of people died, mm -hmm. but your ancestors did not. Mm -hmm. Your ancestors survived, and they thrived. And they came through, and they and it, you know, to me when I started realizing that, and it helped me appreciate, you know, where I came from. A lot of times, I always felt that, you know, in a lot of times, because I was I grew up around non-natives, mm -hmm. so I, there was a lot of shame that I experienced because they would make fun of my long hair, mm -hmm. or I, you know, I was the only brown kid or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But when you have that kind of um, leadership um, that's been passed down and passed through and it's really it's a, like a way of life it's not a you know there's, there's no question now when, when I look at, at people especially non-natives and they they uh, they they have this motivation you know what mm -hmm. motivates them it's usually capitalistic or whatever mm -hmm. self-serving that kind of thing mm -hmm. but Indian people traditionally aren't like that mm -hmm. and you know there's a lot of things that she could have done that would have been 
uh, considered more self-serving than the things that she chose to do and spend her time, mm -hmm. and she didn't do that. And I think that that's really an admirable trait. Yeah. Um, does that ever make you, does it, do, do you ever feel like there's a bar that's set that you need to live up to? Absolutely, uh, but it's good. It's a good standard to have. I think it really drives you to continue to excel and do more. You know, I do the same with my own children. I'm a mother of two sons, and I have pushed the kind of the similar teachings onto them that I, that was presented to me. I think teachings as I grew up as a young child, my uncles and my father uh, and my grandparents would always promote the idea of leadership and um, being very selfless and kind of your everyday action and thought and having integrity in your walk. So an everyday step is. Uh, you know what you do even when people are not watching how you react to your own thoughts and I Really pay attention that, to that because of the way my grandparents were presented to me And it would always be put upon me that well, this is the way your grandmother was and so this is the standard You know she she was very independent. She didn't rely on tribal resources to get things done When she came across a barrier here, she just went around the barrier you know, she always found a way, and they would present other grandparents like that. Uh, when we had, when we went through battles, you know, they would always point out that it was through collaboration and through the strength and our ability to communicate that really helped us survive as a people. We won wars and major battles that many people don't always talk about in the history books, but we know about those battles and we know how we overcame those challenges. Whether it was a hundred of our people against thousands in the U.S. military. We won because we had a better strategy. We worked with the land, we worked with each other, and just being able to build those alignments, and you see how those alignments worked for us back then, and they continue to work for us today. My grandparents, who include not only Lucy Covington, but uh, Emily Pion, um, Louis Friedlander, George Friedlander, they're all founders of 18i. They were all part of the great legacy that we all can benefit from today, and because of that, uh, they showed us as a people that continued collaboration is what saves our, our future, it's what saves our sovereignty, it's what, it's what continues to allow us to thrive as a people connected to Mother Earth and connected to our spiritual ways. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're lost to colonization, we're lost to capitalism, and instead they've chosen a better way for us out of that selflessness. So they, they tell me about these standards, and I think that's what really helps me, because if you don't hear about it you know, in your history books, because I went to Gonzaga Prep too, and that certainly wasn't taught in any of my school books, and there very uh, are rarely are presented any books about uh, tribal people or our history and culture, but I was learning it through my relatives, all the experiences that they had through their parents and grandparents because Lucy and my grandmother Emily, they all, they raised uh, my parents and uh, my relatives who taught me. And so they were, through that extension, my, they were my teachers. So that's why I really adhere to everything that they have done, because while they set this very high standard to be well-educated, uh, to be very knowledgeable about our history, um, so that we don't repeat the same cycles and help me understand that communication is key Collaboration is critical, and they also taught me a lot about how defending even nature, the rights of our people, is vastly critical to our survival as a people. Um, and being independent, you know, I was um, I was taught that through a lot of our my grandparents who were that way. So I I definitely think there's a, a standard set, and that it's it's good to continue teaching our children about these ways. And if we don't pass along these stories, then of course um, you know they're gonna they're gonna lose that that aspect because it's it's definitely not taught in schools but um, it's it needs to be taught in home at the dinner table or in the car rides to and from uh, which is where I tend to apply those same teachings so that my kids understand where we come from uh, and then I you know I, I'm thankful for some of those folks who were able to capture some of these teachings these stories and the books there's a few books in our family that uh, I like to read you know there's some books about my grandfather Chief Moses there's uh, some books about my grandfather, Chief Kamaikin, and there's others that uh, my grandmother, Emily uh, Friedlander Pion, and, and both Grandma Lucy Covington and others were able to contribute to, which captures a lot of our history and names and 
places we were and what happened when and where. You know, all of that's really helpful because that helps me get us that much further because they, they did their part in this part of history and then I'm able to build off of that, uh, that legacy. So that's, that's why I think that's important. But, um, I think we've come a long ways because we went from, and I oftentimes think about this too, because I, I know that they're always with me everywhere I go. And I think, I wonder if they're proud of me. And I, I hope that they are because every day I make decisions based upon how I'm going to honor them. How can I honor them even more so? How can I make them proud so that they know that their legacy is continued in the best way possible, the best light? Uh, and then I'm setting up their continued great-grandchildren, great-great-greats, and uh, making sure I'm doing my part. But I know that um, thinking back to what they've done, you know, accomplishing wars and being successful in that regard, and then fighting against termination, and then being successful in that regard, and into my time to where we're now crossing over and looking at how we can be leaders of this country and how can we be leaders of the world. That's where I'm at. And I think that would not happen if it were not for all of their hard work. So we're still building. So I'm part of that line. And I'd like to say that we, we have come this far. You know, we were almost governor of a state. And, you know, we're, we're crossing over. Um, to present our form of leadership for everybody. So we're not just holding it within, now that we've survived um, acculturation, we've survived colonization, we've survived the mass forms of genocide, and now we're here. You know, we, we're educated, we're uh, ex exploring, we're able to express uh, our ways of life and share that with others. And we want the world to be able to be a part of what we're doing but to do so, they have to accept our leadership. And I think that is that is a lot to offer. And so I'm just thankful that I get to be here and say that my legacy, that line, is, is here for everyone. And I think my grandmother Lucy, my grandmother Emily, all my grandfathers, I think they would all be very proud um, because they know that they, they suffered and they sacrificed and that was all for uh, a worthy cause. And, you know, I want them to, and like when I, it's my time, I want to be able to say the same thing when I'm watching my grandchildren, my great greats, you know, I want to be able to say the same, that everything continues to pass on so that we can, we all know that this, um, this doesn't end here, that it will continue to, to generate something good for the world. What do you think? What, what do you think Lucy would say if she were hearing now about Indian people, the political climate? Where, where, how do you think she would feel? Where do you, where do you think she would fall? In, as far as I mean, there's so much, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of great things going on, but is it? Some people think it's worse now than it. it it's been in hundred years, but um, where do you think she would fall in that? Where do you th what do you think she would say? How do you think she would she would feel about it all? I remember talking to uh, Joel James of the Lummi Nation, and one time he uh, mentioned my grandmother and said that uh, in her time she was fighting these same issues. And so we know that it's these the, the issues, the battles that we have, they're always going to be going on. They're, they're cyclical and it's important for us as a people to continue learning the history and learning the solutions and continuing to find new solutions to address all of these problems. You know, whether it's continuing to fight for the rights to our land or water rights and having a seat at the table so that we can always defend our sovereignty, our independence as separate sovereign nations, that is always going to be an issue for us. And he was saying to me that my grandmother had mentioned this, that while that's the case, it is... It is imperative that we continue to educate our youth. This is why she was so big on education, because if, as long as our youth continue to educate themselves and understand the history and everything that we're going through now, which is why it is imperative that tribal councils or tribal leaders bring their next generation with them to these meetings so that there's no disconnect, so that there isn't a gap in leadership. 
then we'll always be all right because it it is always a matter of educating every single rotating cycle of elected officials on every front, whether it's the local, the state, or the national, or even the international. It is a requirement for us to educate people about our concerns and issues on the home front and how their decisions correlate to our lives. So if we're constantly telling our story, that will help the people who don't have that voice. And so she was just saying that, you know, 20 years from now, she was telling Joel James, you're going to be dealing with this. While I'm the leader on the front line today, 20 years it's going to be upon you to have to lead this conversation because I will no longer be here. And so he, he told me the same thing. He says, I'm glad you're in this room. We were talking about the United Nations Declaration of, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And as I was sitting there with these uh, elder leaders in the room in this longhouse in Lummi Nation, he said, you know, this reminds me of saying, as your grandmother told me, he said that 20 years from now, it will be on you to do this. And I'm glad you're here to listen and learn because each generation has a responsibility and that is an inherent right of us as a people, but it's, it is upon us to make sure that our youth are connected so they understand uh, because soon when it's their time, it is just my hope and prayer that they will be ready. And that was, that was a, some wise words from my grandmother, Lucy. What do you? What would you like people? Can they kind of go backtrack a little bit? What would you like people to know about Lucy Covington? What is something you think maybe people might not know about Lucy? What would they not know? Hmm. I always hear from some of her <coughs> her friends that she was a really fun person, very loving, and I often sort of in my own mind, kind of attribute her to be like a Mother Teresa type individual. But then you'd hear from some people, oh, she loved to you know, have fun and let her hair down. And uh, I always think that that is so important for people to understand as a leader, because I, I will often tell other young people who want to get into leadership roles or get into public office that you have to find that space for yourself where you're able to relax and uh, find comfort and uh, just be able to be yourself. And she found that solace amongst her peers who were other tribal leaders. And she made so many friends at the national level uh, that she was able to be very comfortable uh, just being casual. Um, and that, I think that's, that's something that's important for me to express because we're often put in a box and held up to higher standards. And when you just want to go and relax and be casual with someone, it's, it's almost frowned upon, like, you can't do that. Uh, but yeah, I think people don't often see her as being just a casual human, you know, being able to, to do that, enjoy herself, but also being a woman back in those days, uh, being around men, because there were a lot of men in the room, men leaders. And if you can imagine in the early 70s or 60s what that looked like for a very proud, strong, prominent woman to walk into a room full of men and speaking her mind. And not only just speaking her mind, but doing it unapologetically, how that would be perceived. There would be a lot of men who aren't culturally receptive to that, who would take offense or would want to suppress her, but she did it in a way that wasn't offensive, and she did it because it was just naturally who she is, and instead of offending them, she gained their respect, and not only gained their respect, but then gained their loyalty, and then once she had their loyalty, she was really able to do uh, much more good for the people, and she did it on her own. She didn't do it by bribing. She didn't have to use anyone else's resources. She used her own. And all of this was just done on her own time, her own money, her own dime. Uh, and she did it out of the love for her people. And that's a, a very genuine fact. And I think that's it's just a, such a beautiful thing uh, to have and be part of. We have such a loving, 
woman who was a, a female leader in a time that was uh, far beyond and above what people expected in that generation because women were not seen as CEOs and leaders or chiefs, and she was the chief of her people. Um, but when people outside of our structure culturally don't understand why she's that way, you know, and she was able to overcome all of those barriers culturally, uh, being able to surpass that at the national level even, uh, it's mind-blowing you know, to try to put yourself in that space and what that would have been like. So I don't see that, um, and I, I can't imagine a lot of people would understand that, but she was doing it and you can only try to put yourself in that space and think, you know, what, how did she do that and, um, and how did she become so powerful? So inspirational. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, that's something that we, we definitely can learn from. Because I, I think it's a lot easier now for women to run and do these things, but back then, not so much. And she was still seen to this day as being a very beautiful woman uh, who is truly admired and respected. Because I go to those same halls now, and they recall upon her in a very favorable memory. And so I think she really left strong positive ripples. So, yeah, that's something that people should know about her. Hmm. That's, uh, you, you, you brought up really cool. I mean, that's just, I, I, cause I can't even imagine that. I heard stories about her, um, mm -hmm. when she would go to Congress, I heard them just everybody stopping mm -hmm. what they were doing. I can't imagine people doing that now for anybody that walks in the room, much less an Indian woman in the 50s or the 60s, you know. I think, I try to imagine what that might have been like, and I just, what keeps going through my head is, in the 70s, they didn't even like Billy Jack. I mean, <laughs> and for her to go in there and gain, like you said, gain her, gain their respect, and then still, these generations later, they still have that respect, and they still have that, those types of memories about her is really powerful. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless you were the president of the United States, it's like you don't ever hear those sorts of stories. So. Yeah, and it's like, she wasn't even president of the Colville's. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what, uh, can you tell, do you know, have you heard any stories from, from what she did back then? Did you, did you hear any kind of humorous ones that might have been? Humorous ones. Oh, I don't know if I want to tell it on film. <laughs> oh, there's probably some stuff I should not say. But <clears throat> uh, I don't hear like funny stuff. I guess just like all of us, you know, when we're hanging with our friends, it's uh, in a casual sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's just nice to see that she was human. It was nice to hear that because the my whole life I I just saw her as a, a superhero. And, uh, yeah, you, you, you see someone in a different light, and then you meet their friends. I mean, I see the same thing. I, I think my sons look at me as just being mom, like, oh, that's just my mom, you know. And then other people will look at me as a hero or someone super then. And then there will be those who are, like, my close friends who are like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, she was just, she was my friend. Um, because they know me very casually. So I think it's just who you really talk to and how they see you. I, I met some of her personal friends, and they would just they would say that you know she was definitely very fun. She was fun, very charismatic, and always kind of like the life of the room. She was a light. So, yeah, but they all, they, everyone always spoke very well of her. So that's kind of what we all want. We all want everyone to speak well of us as we leave the room. 